Hello and welcome to this session of uh, guest lectures in Sonification. Uh, I am Eric Dahl and I will lead uh, this section on behalf of the NCT students. Uh, the lectures are a part of the Sonification course offered in the NCT program and will explore how uh, professionals work within the field of Sonification. I am happy to present our first uh, lectures of this series. Elvin Bronsag is a composer and performer working in the fields of algorithmic improvisation and sound ins installations. He earned his uh, degree at uh, the Jazz Conservatory at Antony, where he played the vibraphone. The vibraphone is an instrument that sounds so nice uh, how, no matter what you play on it. And although many people find this to be uh, an advantage, uh, I even regarded it as a challenge. And he soon started to add distortion and other effects to his signal from the vibraphone. This was his entry into electric music. In 2008, he completed his PhD at uh, NTNU, where, um, uh, where uh, he made a computer program that he could improvise with. He excels at building unique musical instruments and ins installations, and if you were to visit his office, you would see installations such as self-reflection, a, uh, a speaker powered by a helicopter engine, which Avin uh, describes as faster than sound, but stationary. Sonification is the translation of data values into sound, but Avin is interested in creating sounds that represent the data in a meaningful way, and, the sound, uh, can, and that the sound can relate to the origin of the data. When he works with sonification installations, Avin always starts with uh, visiting the research area to get inspired by the place, and the, uh, uh, the place where the data comes from. His job is then to tie the art piece to the uh, place of origin, to facilitate uh, the relation between art and the field. There will be a question section at the end, but Evan encourages you to uh, ask questions uh, and for clarification underway. Uh, so feel free to ask questions and partake in dialogue when we're still on the relevant subject. In his talk, uh, Aiden will present us with two uh, projects that he has been working with. Welcome to the talk, Composition and Mapping in Sound Installations, Primre and VLBI Music. Welcome. Thank you. So, uh, this is on? Yep. 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 So, um, yeah, as uh, Eric said, uh, I'll be talking about uh, two sound installation projects and um, how I have used uh, sonification as part of the creative process in those uh, two pieces. The, uh, the picture here is from Svalbard uh, that I visited uh, in connection with the, the work on VLBI music. So, uh, making a sound installation is also a type of composition. So uh, thinking of composition as organization of sound over time, finding some different uh, themes to evolve and have similarities between themes and gradual change and then contrasting themes. Each of these themes can be seen as a way of representing a particular piece of the data. When we view uh, sound installations as a way of representing data. They, they don't have to be, but usually when I make installations, it's, it's related to representing some part of the site, the place, or the organization for which the installation is built, or similar. So, just to get into the, the mood of how I think on sonification, a few words on algorithmic composition might be um, relevant. So uh, these are just uh, some images uh, generated by algorithms that we can also use to create music. Uh, especially interesting is all sorts of feedback systems, Lindenmeyer systems, which are these um, plant-like figures that you see, um, cellular automata, which are these uh, black dots uh, which is representing um, cells that are alive or dead 
and each line of uh, cells is one generation. Uh, we also have more statistical models like Markov models and further into AI techniques. So uh, I'm going to show you one or actually two algorithmic techniques. Um, and let's see here. If we look at this image, uh, your job now is to tell me which one of these algorithms are used in this piece. Any ideas? Cellular automata. What's more? Cellular automata. Yes. Why? <coughs> you can explain. Leave it to you. So, um, you see my pointer here, uh, my mouse pointer. So, if you if you look at this uh, this figure here, with one dot in the first. Uh, generation, there's one cell alive. Uh, let's clear this. Uh... Uh, no, everyone is dead. Um, <laughs> and I will insert this one live cell. And you can look at what happens. You can see this point on, on my screen to the left. One live cell there. And we put it with this note here. Questions to what happened? Is no, it? Just yeah. one question. Yeah. So this, uh, the white squares are the spaces, like the empty nodes. Yeah. So they are how it, it is it is predefined to where you want the empty cells. Or yeah. So the way I've done it, I I treat it almost like a step sequencer. So let's say we have 16th notes and none of them are playing, but when there is one live cell in the middle, that one is playing. And that means it's an ocean of silence and then one event. And then this comes again. But the next time we come to this point, we go to the next generation of, of uh, cells and then there's, it has split into three. And the way that this develops from generation to generation is defined by the, the growth rules. And these can differ. We can set whatever rules we want. But in this instance, we get a pattern that grows uh, like a triangle here. Yeah. Uh, is the pattern randomized or is it predetermined? This is predetermined, totally. Oh. OK. So it's based on. Um, a way of thinking that, okay, uh, let's say if we have no cells alive, there's no reason for any cell to be alive. Mm. If there is one cell alive, 
it might uh, generate some companions, it might grow into something else. But then, in this case, in the second generation, there's three cells neighboring, and there's not enough food for everyone. <laughs> so someone will die. So the, you see, in the next generation, there's a hole in the middle, but it continues to grow outwards. And then there's one single cell to the right, and that grows into three cells. But the two neighboring cells have a different evolution patterns. So depending on the neighborhood of the cell, it will evolve. And actually, the, the, the row about here is a representation of the rule set that we use currently. So then you can also see that uh, a... Uh, no neighboring cells need to dead cell. And if everyone is alive, there's also, you will also be dead in the next generation. So those are the eight uh, chunk of like, uh, what? I mean, it's segments. And so you have eight segments. I guess. Yeah, there's eight possibilities for your neighborhood when you have three cells. Okay. So um, let's just hear that again. And when I insert one node, it will grow this structure. If I insert one more node, it generates like its own family tree. If I insert a chord, that chord will also grow in that same manner. So, So that's just uh, just an example of an a way to translate an algorithm into musical representation. And as you can see, uh, there are some choices that I made. And when you make music with these algorithms, it will probably sound very different. I'll show you one uh, more example while we are at it. And this is a lot less uh, interactive in a way. Uh, let's see. Because So which algorithm is this? Wild guess. Markov models? No. Let's let's hear one more. So let me explain to you what why I what I hear. I hear some long notes and then some shorter notes springing from each of those longer notes. Let's take it down an octave so it's not extremely bright. So this is uh, a representation of a Lindenmeyer system, which is used to generate uh, these kind of plants or growths. And we have uh, one branch, or the root is maybe one long note, in the way that I have represented it. And then each, this long note branches off into two or three shorter notes. And then each of them branches off into several even shorter notes. Then uh, I've added drums to some of the, the branches. But the idea, um, of this algorithm is that uh, you can see a similar pattern happening, let's say, on this uh, plant over here. 
the way that we have one branch coming up at an angle like this and another junction here branching off in a different way. And these are the two patterns that go again and again and again to create the whole structure. All right, so uh, this is uh, just like background mat material on how to, to take some sort of evo self-evolving algorithm and, and make it into music. So uh, onto one of the installations um, projects that I uh, will tell you about. This is called Flindre. Um, it's made on top of a sculpture by the Norwegian artist Nils Oss. Uh, so he made the aluminum structure that is here. Uh, it's placed two hours north of Trondheim in a place called Indre, right next to a tidal stream. So water, I mean, it looks like a river, but it, the tide water comes in for six hours and then go out for six hours. So this is a way of the lungs of the place, if you want. I mean, new material come in every six hours and then it, it goes out again. Uh, in like a hundred years ago, uh, local fishermen were fishing a, um, a, a special species of flounder, flatfish, uh, which was golden, that was special for this, uh, this place, and it was exported as a delicacy. Uh, so that's also part of the identity of this place. Then also, um, Nils also made this, uh, this representation of a, of a flatfish in this large sculpture. And sort of, I don't know, unintentionally, uh, it has a very great sound. <laughs> so if you pass by and, and touch this, the metal, it's like boom. And for me, being a percussionist, this was exciting. So uh, at the same time, I became aware of uh, contact mi uh, microphones, of course, but contact speakers, so a way of transferring vibrations into the metal. So this is what I've, I have uh, mounted here on the sculpture, uh, trying to be as discreet as possible, not to impose on the original artwork. So inside each of these boxes are a contact speaker, a transducer, and also a small microphone. And then I have a computer program generating the audio to be played on the sculpture uh, and also picking up the sound that it makes so the whole thing can be streamed online. For those who are not able to um, experience the work in on site. So, um, I mean, this is, this is a project that I initiated and I asked uh, Nils Oss if he was willing to allow me to, to do it. And then I also applied for funding to realize it, which took the best part of three years. So I started in 2003, wanting to do this. And in 2006, it opened. It has been playing 24 seven since 2006. So it's now in its 13th year. Hmm and it's planned to play until 2026. Uh, and I wanted to make something that represented how this sculpture is experienced in the environment. Or I don't know how everyone else experienced it, but I'll take as a starting point how I experience it. So it, it looks different in different light, in different weather, and the tides are right next to it, the tidal stream, so that obviously influences the, the identity and the, the feeling of the place. Um, and the time of year matters. And even, I mean, our different moods in different weekdays could be said to influence like how this, how, how we experience an artwork. So a Tuesday afternoon being busy on the way home to make dinner is completely different than say a Sunday or a Saturday. So all of these different environmental variables, I wanted to use them to create uh, the music for the piece. And this 
came into um, this coagulated sort of into uh, some different compositional modules that I use for this piece. So some of these modules are directly based on the tidal water. Um, and you know uh, Rissé Glissando, like shepherd tones? Some know, some maybe don't know. So this is a, um, an idea from electroacoustic music uh, of an, a glissando that can continue upwards forever. And the way that it can continue forever is that when it has reached a certain pitch, you start another note uh, adding to the glissando and you fade this one out and then continuously add new notes so you have a, a rising tone forever. Uh, so my idea with this was to take sort of a, a noise, filtered noise thing that would represent how the tides come in and it goes up for six hours and then slowly <laughs> stops according to the speed of the tides, then goes out. And there are some particles in this uh, stream and it sounds basically like this. Okay, so this, this goes on and on. Um, and it's, a, a, I use this as one of the very um, simple translations of the signals from the environment. I mean, it's pretty easy to, to get the connection. Uh, maybe even if you don't know, a lot of people will not read the user manual for an artwork, but just go there and try to experience it. And, if you go there like a few times now and then and you ex you hear this sound and you could without further instructions relate it to the tidal stream that is right next to it and figure out the connection. Um, then other compositional modules uh, are an inter interval melody generator where I've used techniques from like um, Dodecaphonic, uh, like uh, Schoenberg and Webern uh, compositional techniques, 12 tone techniques, but in more like an, a simpler intervallic fashion. And then I have a, a software module that generates melodies, and then the intervals come from very simple things like what weekday is it, what time is it, how many minutes past the hour, and what month is it and then the months uh, does not necessarily have uh, one for January two for February but uh, also more mythological uh, associations and what can I mean for example June would be six semitones which would be a, a tritone which is the diabolic <laughs> interval which is not very representative of the feeling of June so there are some, some questions there. Uh, by the way, uh, these, uh, you can see the, the sound file names for each of the examples I play, and they are represented by year, month, day, hour, and minute. And every eight or nine hours, the installation will make a one minute sample of itself. So it generates an archive over time, so there's there's thousands of samples there now, represented how it did sound. So this was uh, actually right after the opening in, in 2006. It sounded like this.
Uh, so this was pretty quiet. And as you can see, this is a uh, quarter past 11 in the evening and it's generally less active at night. Also to save uh, the, the neighbors uh, night's sleep. <laughs> so uh, sometimes when you put uh, sound installations in a public space, someone will call from up, this, up the street to say, everyone sleeps at night, <laughs> just not me. <laughs> <laughs> this can happen. Uh, for this installation, we did uh, really, we started like three years before the activation of the piece, talking to the, to, the, to the locals and raising sort of awareness that we were going to add this piece uh, to their close environment. Um, one of the old ladies that had been pretty skeptical all the time um, came at the opening day here and she said, well, I don't think this is music, <laughs> but you can turn it up a bit. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think it's, it's really important if you want to make a, an audio artwork in a public space to have the, the close, uh, closest users that experience it on a daily basis with you. Someone oh, working in a kiosk right next by will say that this is annoying. How yeah, loud so. is it? It's approximately on the level of other sounds in the environment. And this is another thing that I find interesting by working with odd sound in public spaces, to make it just on the same level as the sounds that are there which means that you have a different level of dynamic. You can't really do fine, nuanced things and expect people to hear them. So a lot of your finely tuned sounds will get lost in bird song and traffic. But then again, you get the interaction with these other environmental sounds. And even for me, sometimes if I make something that sounds a little bit like birds and I pass the installation and it's like, Oh, is it is that me or is it the birds over there? And I find that really intriguing, and it's a, a plus of, of experiencing a sound installation in public space. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, like, uh, how did you make it happen? The interaction with the environment. So, what were your inputs and like? Yes, basically. Yeah. So, um, since you asked, we can look at the the general. Um, flow chart of the installation. So we have the, the sculpture here on the, on the bottom. Uh, and the sensors on the sculpture feed into uh, a sensor interface. And these are light and temperature. And the tidal water status I get from, from the sea, the ocean mapping service as a, just a table that you can look up. So you know what, what the tide will be for the next 10 years. They predict this kind of things. Uh, and I mean, most of the rest of it is based on dates and clock, right? So this sensor data is streamed uh, on the internet over to a server that is actually here on Glöshagen which does the, runs the compositional program, getting the input data and producing sound in according to my description. Then streaming the sound out via internet to the sculpture again. Then uh, I pick up the sound from the sculpture, also streaming that back online and then there's a shotcast server that we can listen to uh, how it sounds live. Did, I, did uh, that answer your question or was it more specific to actual uh, each and every sensor? No, actually. So uh, how many sensors do you have there? Here it's actually just temperature and light. Temperature and light. So the rest is based on, on, the, on the time and date. There was a, a plan for an, a termin like sensor to, to sense if people approach the sculpture. So I wanted to sort of turn it down even lower if no one was there. 
So, and I tried to hack, at, because building like an audience detection sensor is like things you would do on an airport surveillance system. So I tried to hack a, an, a Termin kit, but I run into a huge problem when I buried the antenna in the ground. So it, I wasn't able to sell, solve it. Then I figured, let's let's skip that. <laughs> so this this actually runs uh, whether people are there or not. But a lot of people had heard about this sensor, so many people still think that it's interactive. And also, if you think it's interactive, it will seem as if it is interactive. <laughs> Yeah, um, it's the recording of the installation. Is that uh, yeah, are you recording on the in, in on the structure or recording nearby, like the environment? So uh, the recording, the stream that goes live yeah. out is on the on the structure. Okay. So in the small boxes that you saw here. Uh, there is a transducer and also a small microphone. Yeah. And it's a regular microphone for air. Okay. So if anyone shouts next to it, it will go online on the stream. Yes. Yeah. And if you tap on the sculpture, you can sort of send a message to your rich uncle in America, send more money. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how big is this sculpture, Ivan? Uh, Here it's um, like so huge. Yeah, it is pretty huge. I mean, uh, if I'm standing right next to it, I am up to here. So it's, I don't know, six meters or something. Okay. So it's made out of aluminum. So if you hit it, then like um, you said. Yeah. And how much does wind affect? The wind actually uh, takes hold of these uh, yeah. propellers and make a whole lot of noise. So that uh, totally drowns out my part of it. Okay. But it's uh, this. I find this a, a good thing that sort of sometimes it's audible, sometimes not, and it's not because someone decided to turn it off. It just happens so. But the recordings are they uh, influenced in the same way as uh, standing next to it? Well, so the recordings that we save they go directly from the computer. But they're recordings during a storm. Yes. So we stream online the actual signal from site, but we record the line signal that goes to the site. Mm. So we're not recording if you send a message to your uncle in America. It's not, okay. it's not recorded. So this is the dry signal. Mm. Uh, we can hopefully we can hear what's happening right now. Then I also have uh, the stream going from the installation, but I have to, well, we can listen to it first and uh, I can explain what's wrong afterwards. It's just important to know that when you put audio, we don't hear the microphones, it's talk. Yes, I know. So, so um, I think I didn't talk on top of it, did I? Uh, I saw you move your lips on the right now. Okay, oh. yeah. To someone from <laughs> Uh, Probably you can use that talk button there. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. But I want I want talk on top of the audio. So now we will hear uh, the uh, the live stream, which sounds like this just now. the The audio is down there buried, but I have a um, a ground loop that happened during the winter, because sometimes uh, water comes into these uh, boxes. 
and the microphones are actually sometimes uh, they are frozen in ice. <laughs> so this is what happened, uh, and I need to go there and and just change the microphones and clean up inside the boxes, and it will be back. <laughs> so, but these times th these things happen over the over the course of ten years, of course. So yeah, I wonder how did you do all the testing? It sounds uh, you wanted to test for over the course of a year, knowing how winter behaves, how summer, how was that? Yeah, during the composition process, uh, I found this really hard. And I would just have to set my time of, the, of my computer to the time that I wanted to simulate, mm -hmm. and then set some imaginary values for temperature and light and see what it could sound like. Um, and I must admit, it was, uh, I took it pretty hard on myself during the, the, the last month before opening, trying to figure out, because then it was planned to run for 10 years. So it was composed as a 10 year piece. And I, even though that I talk about it, my stomach gets a little bit uh, unsturdy thinking about how do you, I mean, how do you capture a time span like that? Mm. So it's, um, I don't know, it's just trial and error. And sometimes I am surprised by how it sounds, but it's meant to be sort of recognizable. And what you heard just now would maybe remind you a little bit of the melodic generator that you heard from the, from the beginning. Um, let's see. That... Um, some of these other modules, I don't have to, to explain everything, but I can, sh I can play short pieces. This is a more like a John Cage inspired, inspired composition techniques. Uh, yeah, that was very John Cage. The children's song that you heard in the beginning there is actually uh, granulated from my own kids singing songs representing each month. So um, I don't know how it, this is in other countries, but in, in Norway, when I went to, to primary school, we had this, this songs for every month in the year and it was sort of uh, some very, something very recognizable. So these are also incorporated. Um, in here, but you can almost never hear them in their original state. Also some clouds of granular processing like this. And some of these uh, sounds could res resemble like bird song, bird activity, or the activity of the flounder when it's sort of on the bottom of the ocean floor, sitting there and then going. So, um, and then just as an, uh, to show that I was also surprised. I mean, if it's full moon, Saturday night and brighter than it was, five minutes ago and warmer than it was yesterday and it's summer and everything is turned on, uh, then um, it would sound like this. So, um, so uh, I was also surprised, but in, in this case, uh, the tempo had just skyrocketed, so everything was happening really, really fast. So the sounds have been playing like continuously? 
without any breaks or pause or yes and each of these composition modules that i was talking about here they um they are just structured one after another sometimes one happens at the same time as another and then these two come and then those three so this is sort of an instrumentation procedure that has actually nothing to do with environmental data it's more like a composition like what would you want to do would you want one to continue if it's already playing maybe it continues and adds another and then this one continues and adds two others and then goes back and i was really worried about how these changes would work because usually when you compose music you pay special attention to closing something down and then starting something new and in this case it just stops and then starts something else and I was really worried about that before uh, making the piece. When I experience it now, it's like there's so many transitions that I really, really like. Mm. So it's like, oh, how did you do that? <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I know how it, how it happens and there, it's not really intelligent as such, but it, I think it sort of works. Yeah. How often do you have to go there and change something because it's broken or uh, and how do you get to know about it like is someone sends you a mail or you go in and monitor sometimes or yeah what yeah do you do? i use these live streams to mm. monitor and i check like every other week or some something and the the data lab where the computer is housed they send me um like administrative messages uh, if they need to reboot the computer or update something. And then I get this uh, on a specific time and I can put in my calendar check that it's alive. In the very beginning, it was a lot of physical maintenance to sort of make sure that it continued to work. Um, and then I was there quite a lot for the first few months. But now it's generally, I mean, I intend to do a service once every year and sometimes I postpone it and then winter comes and it was like okay I can't do it now <laughs> so it it uh, continues to work remarkably stable but as you could hear in the in the live stream from the site the output sound from the site is now frozen or broken in some ways yeah and if I guess since uh, well it's going to play for so long I don't know if I could like focus on something for so long. So uh, I'm just wondering, um, since you probably don't have a supervisor watching the installation saying, ah, now it's, uh, now it's down, you gotta fix it now. Yeah, yeah. So you can, as you say, postpone things as long as you want, I guess. But uh, then probably someone comes there and they will have a bad experience and you yeah. will probably receive a mail or something, I don't know. Yeah, so this is this is also this has been discussed in um, in Kuru, which is uh, the Norwegian office for for public art, and uh, there we discussed who should have the responsibility of such an installation. Should you buy a service from a company that makes sure this runs smoothly, or should it be up to the the buyer of the installation, the owner, or to the artist? And this was maybe 10 years since I was, since we discussed this. And at the time, I, I think I agree with myself still. I, I think that the artist should be responsible because I know I, it's in my interest that this works. And it's really embarrassing when it don't. So I, I just take an interest in making sure it works. And that's also the municipality, the local authorities, they also uh, wanted me to be responsible. So they would rather pay me money than hire some company to do it. Yeah. And my mother told me when I was uh, a lot smaller that she uh, really uh, looked forward to when I grew up and uh, she didn't really need to take care of my basic needs as much. Yeah. Do you experience the same thing now that your installation is 13 years old? Because uh, 
you have to go over there and fix everything. It's kind of like having a child. You have to feed it and just keep it uh, alive. But mm -hmm. when uh, 20 years has passed and it's uh, not going to be on anymore, is that sad or is it a relief that it's hap uh, ending? Or what do you think about this? Have you ever thought about it? Yeah, there was this question when in 2016 when it was running up from its original running period and it was supposed to stop and I was like, yeah, this this was the plan all along, so I'm good with that and it was also composed to be interesting for that amount of time but actually, I mean, you, there is like a, a cycle of one year mm -hmm. that and it the next year the same situations will happen but of course since it relates to what also happened the day before or five minutes before so everything will progress in a little bit different way each year and then i thought that this is good for 10 rounds and uh i hadn't really given too much thought about what would happen after 10 years but the local authorities and the audience there were really eager to keep it running. And I thought, well, yeah, it's okay. It starts to become a little bit dated. Maybe you can hear the electronic sounds like 2006, or I can, I can know that it sounds like I did in 2006 at least, but it's still, it's fairly okay. And there's less and less work with it, as with a kid. It was the first few months, and then mm. the first year, uh, everything was sort of experienced for the first time. And in the first winter, uh, we had also made um, the terrain go uh, fall away so that water wouldn't collect into in the, the equipment box, which you couldn't see in the image. It's behind a, some some small trees there. But um, so we made sure that it wouldn't be flooded. But then a nice um, guy that takes care of the park had added a lot of uh, shingle and, and sand, mm. which made the terrain fall into. Uh, so the whole box was full of water and everything had a short, it had been a shortcut and poof, just everything was off. And I thought, okay, well, we have a budget to service these things, so I have to buy a new one of this and this and this and this. I took them home, put them on the bathroom floor, heated floor, for <laughs> for one night, and the next morning, let's let's just test them before we throw them in the trash. And everything worked. Hmm. So, well, okay, put it back. <laughs> so, so if you're given the same question after the next uh, ten year period. I don't really know because it's getting it's getting more and more worn out and the cables are really in a bad shape. I could I didn't prepare for it, but I could show you images. When you open one of these boxes, there's all sorts of creatures living in there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they also eat on the rubber of the cables. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it's it's a whole party. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I, it won't last forever. Okay. And I guess it will, at some point, it will start to be serious problems. Mm. And then I have to remake the whole cabling system, I guess. But for artistic reasons, um, I wouldn't know either. Maybe it's enough. Mm. There's a question yeah. then also. Uh, I, uh, so coming from, uh, I already mentioned before, uh, jazz education in Trondheim, the jazz linear. Yeah. And improvisation in that uh, genre. Uh, I was wondering if that affects your compositional approach when you are taking those kind of installations, if any, because it's uh, in a way kind of semi improvised but with rules, which are the algorithms. Or how do you look at it? Yeah. Do you see Do you see any correlation to more traditional compositional approaches when you when you uh, face those uh, installations? Yes, thank you. Uh, that's an interesting question. And um, I think that, for example, the interval melody generator is directly connected to what I did in the 
with the vibraphone in the jazz department because after studying jazz vibraphone for two years, I was totally fed up with uh, functional harmony, 251 progressions, um, walking bass and swing cymbal. I was, <laughs> it was enough. I wanted something else. And I wanted to still have some sort of, I don't know, the, the harmonic system is really uh, comforting. You, you know how it works. So it's a system. So I wanted to have some sort of systematic backing to what I played. Um, so I started making software. Uh, even back then, it was 96, 97, where I made my first Max program to, to register what I played on the vibes and put it just in a melodic, uh, just a table of pitches. Uh, and then this was played back on a disc clavier. So it didn't really sound as electronic music, but it was an acoustic vibes with a computer and then a disc player. And it would play stuff that was based on what I had played. So that was the system. So it was sort of an internal feedback system. Um, so whatever mode I was playing in, uh, this, the computer would sort of continue in the same vein. And this is very much uh, mirrored in the way that I approach this intervallic melody system later. And also the work with expanding the vibraphone timbre from just nice doom sound to, to a more wider palette of sounds uh, also comes through on, on the way that I think of timbre and sonic composition here, I think. Do you treat the, do you see the algorithms as set of rules for the compositions? Like they kind of limit or they open, they, they tell you basically what to do, they tell the sound what to do? Um, no? I'm not sure. I think, I think I use the algorithms to generate material that I can then uh, direct in some, that I can guide in some direction. Mm -hmm. So it generates a mass of stuff and I can say, okay, a little less of that and come here, do, do this thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then if the algorithm also responds to the material and how, or how I have guided it, then it's even more a good situation. Great, thank you. Yep. Yeah. Okay, uh, I will progress to the next uh, installation, which is similar in some respects, but also has a, a different uh, material, and thus it comes out differently. So this is uh, called VLBI music, and VLBI stands for Very Long Baseline Interferometry, which is not in my daily vocabulary either, <laughs> if, you're, uh, if you don't know what it is. We'll, we'll, we'll figure out. So this was a, a commission. So the, the Flinder piece was initiated by me, and I applied to get funding, and after three years got funding <laughs> from the government and also from the local municipality. And maybe you also wonder how much does it cost? So usually for these two productions, the my budget is like 500,000 kroner. Round lump sum. For the whole period of 20 years? For 10 years to, to make it and then have some money to, to make sure that it keeps running. Uh, but sometimes you're asked, to do a piece for 30,000 kroner. And that can also happen. I mean, you can always make it happen, but to make something stable and secure and not wear yourself out, this is basically what I find. It, it's a good budget. Okay, so this was a commission for the Norwegian Mapping Authority. They make maps and they make sure that uh, the property boundaries with your neighbors are set in, in stone, actually, <laughs> uh, so that everyone knows, uh, and everyone knows where the road goes and everything. So, so they have um, a main uh, a headquarter 
in Hønefoss in southern Norway and Kuru, Public Art Norway, asked me to do an art piece for them. So I had to go there and, and visit them and figure out what, it's, what is it that they do. Uh, and I saw that uh, map, ma map making has a long tradition of international collaboration. I mean, you would always have to talk to the people in the next country and, and also global measurements of what's the shape of this globe that we have and how does it distort the maps and everything like that. So a lot of interesting possibilities. One thing that I didn't know was that the mapping authority measure distant quasars. And why would they? I thought. So maybe you wonder also. So um, the reason is that uh, the globe spins and the continents floats around on this globe and the globe spins, yeah, and it moves through space and the sun, I mean, everything moves. Nothing is stationary. And to make a map, you would need some sort of reference point. So since nothing is really stable, but we can, if you drive with a car, you can see the distant mountains in the horizon. They move relatively little in relation to you. So if we find a point that is extremely far away, we can use it as a stationary point. And these quasars, they are a billion light years away. Approximately, I mean, not all of them at the same distance, but that's the range where they are at. So for us, we can use them as if they were stationary. So that's the reason for, for measuring uh, them. And the way that we measure is to uh, have uh, different telescopes at different places, uh, different positions on the globe, pointed to the same quasar, and then triangulate to figure out where are these telescopes in relation to the star. And then we can know where we are, and we can start making maps. So uh, this whole process I found intriguing and wanted to learn more about how it works and, and how I could use it. So I went to one of these antennas uh, that is placed in Svalbard, uh, in Ny Olesen, which is, as far as I know, the, the northernmost uh, city where there is a permanent, uh, where people is living there year round. Uh, in the winter, it's like 40 people. You cannot um, have your cell phone on. Every radio communication is uh, <laughs> prohibited. You cannot cook your own food. And there is uh, one, so you don't need to buy a lot of stuff, but there is one shop. And it's open for one hour on Monday and one hour on Thursday. <laughs> 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 and you get all the meals in the cantina and there's a, a proper handling of your garbage and everything is extremely clean. There is like five kilometers of road and they gave me a car when I came there. <laughs> so I was like, oh, you gave me a car. Yeah, it's not as if you can run away with it because the road ends five <laughs> kilometers up there. <laughs> but of course, uh, I mean, to get anywhere, you would need the car because of the ice beers you're not allowed to go anywhere without uh, being in a, in a car or having someone with you that knows how to use a gun. The only <coughs> kind of workers living, what kind of people? Sorry? What kind of settlement is that? What kind of people so are it's living? mostly research nowadays. Earlier there was a coal mine. Um, so that was that's basically it, but it's, it's more and more research. And... and the type of research that requires extremely clean conditions and these radio antennas they are susceptible to noise and also both radio pollution and also environmental pollution so and it also correlates really well with the the agenda of the project because the the what we can do with these quasar measurements is calibrate our um, satellite navigation system and we use this satellite navigation system to look at the Earth and 
with this we can also measure things like the rise of the ocean if the ocean had risen like three centimeters since last year how do you measure i mean you would need to have mm. solid reference points outside of the globe and these points would be calibrated by the radio antennas looking at the quasars so it's a long signal chain to make this possible Well, while in the mm -hmm. Svalbard, I also had the chance of testing the, the bathing conditions <laughs> in, uh, in April. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, nice. it was a fun trip. After Svalbard, they sent me to, uh, to say, uh, if, you, if you want to learn more, uh, you need to go to the Correlation Central. And it's like, for me, this sounds like something in the local supermarket. Uh, the, the people at the Correlation Central. What, what is it? So that's the Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy in Bonn. And there I, I learned more about the nature of quasars. And this is, it's called a quasar because it's a, a quasi-stellar uh, object, a quasi-stellar radio source. And we don't know exactly what's in the center here, but it's most likely some sort of black hole. Or like a black hole uh, and it has an accretion disk so material comes into the black hole from from like a centrifugal force uh, or the opposite i mean it's coming in and a big spiral drawn in here and in the center there's so much mass uh, and so much pressure that it has to go somewhere and it's said nothing can ex escape from a black hole but we have these jets that comes out from uh, perpendicular to this plane. There goes uh, radio jets. And these jets are also in, in the, on the size of light years. They are extremely powerful, extremely over huge distances. And this is what we see from our distance. We don't see the star or the object itself. We see these jets. So that was uh, something about the the quasars. Sorry, did you just yes. choose some quasar randomly, or I, I thought about it when I saw that on the first arm, I would choose the sun. But, uh, that would be probably still too too much movement. So how do you? Yes. So I I don't pick the quasars, but <laughs> the system they have, uh, they pick several different quasars in different directions so that they can measure in different directions and they will also switch uh, quasars if there is some condition that make one of them less useful perhaps there is some occlusion some other object and then they start using something else and they have a big selection so, so it's a, a bigger system like that So, um, I started looking into what, what is this signal that we get from the stars and how can we use it. So, uh, one of the first things I learned was that the actual signal, even though it's one of the strongest signals that we can get, it's, it's very, very weak. So, it's buried in background noise. So, just the cosmic background radiation is a thousand times stronger than the signal from a star. And being a nerd of audio filtering, I started thinking, okay, how can we, I mean, how can you look into a signal like that and get anything? Um, it's basically, it's like, it's, uh, it's not looking for needle in a haystack, it's looking for a hay in a haystack. Mm. <laughs> and um, when we receive this signal, it's split into several different frequency bands and it's extremely um, compressed so it's only one bit representation mm -hmm. so for each of these frequency bands you have a, sing uh, a, a one if there is a signal and a zero if there is no signal and then even more so how do you find this one in a thousand mm. um, occurrence well, I started just listening to the, the frequency bands and, and this uh, binary representation, which sounds like this. So 
so that's it. I mean, uh, just, and I tell you this also, like, it's a way of getting acquainted, getting familiar with the signal, trying to look at it and wearing many different ways. And this is also how it relates to the subject of sonification, listening to the signal in as many ways as possible. And this, uh, these frequency splits were based on the actual measurements that they do scientifically. And also the different pitches that you heard were based exactly on the frequencies that the original radio signal is split into, but of course pitched down because it's in the range of gigahertz, like two to eight gigahertz, and we just pitched it down to something useful. Audible. Mm. And it's also slowed down in extremely when you hear it here. Probably by several thousand uh, degrees. So, I mean, it's also in, in the matter of gigahertz sampling rate. So it wouldn't make sense. It would just be high pitched noise, but now it's going really, really slowly. So, uh, how can we make any sense out of this? Well, one thing that I find extremely poetic about this is that if we have something that is completely unfamiliar to us, we can ask a friend. <laughs> can you also look at it? And tell me, uh, what do you think? Um, so if we are several people looking at the same unknown thing, uh, then maybe, uh, maybe we can figure it out together. And in this case also, if two antennas look at the same extremely noisy signal at the same time, they can correlate and figure out, okay, whatever is the same at both locations is the true signal. The rest is background noise. So if you correlate over a long time and you put stuff on top of each other, if we have complete randomness, there would be sometimes a positive amount, sometimes a negative amount, and over time, this cancels out. But any real signal, it's, it's not completely random, but it's the signal from the star, which is, I mean, it is noisy, but it's at least the same noise coming to these di two different locations. Then it adds up and it grows over time. And then we can say, okay, here we have, then we can adjust the time difference between these two antennas. And if we know the time difference, we know where they are. Because the signal coming in from here at light speed, and we know the time it arrived here and here, then we know how uh, the spacing of these two points on that axis. So that's a way of extracting uh, meaning from, from noise. Um, and this, the way this works is like uh, the classical double slit experiment where you, that you can also find in in particle physics, uh, where you have a plane wave coming in here, and these two slits are like the antennas, uh, and they create wave-like uh, patterns, interference patterns between each other, and the screen in the back here is can be equal, equal to the correlation process, where you look at these two signals together, and you find some peaks where they interact. And actually, uh, the precision that this requires means that uh, the distance between each of these peaks are equal to one wavelength of the radio signal, which is, I mean, it's equal to one wavelength of light, which is, I mean, this is tiny. Mm -hmm. To make a useful um, measurement here, we have to know before where we think that these objects are, and then use this to precisely calibrate from our assumption where they actually are. And this is, I find this also pretty, I mean, maybe I'm super nerdy, but I find it pretty poetic that we, something that we don't know, and we make an assumption, and then we look at our environment, and we refine that assumption, so we know something more about us. And when we know more precisely where we are, we can refine our assumption of where the star is. 
and then so it goes iter iteratively and we can refine um, our assumptions and our calibration and measurements of the environment. So one uh, measurement they make in this uh, system is the, the quality. They measure their own quality of measurement to say something about how sure are we. And this is reflected in, uh, in this interference pattern. And then I took the signal from several antennas looking at how well do they match in phase. Um, and this is not my invention, it's data that I just get from the process. And I took, I took each pair of antennas, gave them one uh, pitch, and then uh, the rhythm of these um, good quality, bad, bad quality, is sort of the amplitude of the, of the pitches. And that was... Is yes. this the most expensive instrument in the world? <laughs> <laughs> Playing simple sign tones, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I think uh, for me, the aesthetic of simple sign tones as mm. source material here also relates to, I don't know, some sort of sci fi impression of a sign tone with the reverb on it. It's, it's a little bit radio spacey kind of vibe for me, at least. So, um, the way these antennas, like Carolina asked, how do they select the, the different um, quasars? So, th there is a list of quasars here and there. And all of the antennas over the world participate in a global choreography. So, all of the antennas that can reach a star in that direction, I mean, the ones on the back side of the, in the shade of the globe, they don't participate. But all on, on the front, according to that star, participate. They turn towards that star, measure for maybe two or three minutes, and then they turn off and they have a schedule. Now everyone point to that star. <laughs> measure for two or three minutes, and now everyone go to that star. And the schedule, then uh, some of them drop out because they are out of sight from a star. Some of them engage. And uh, this combines into this global choreography. And you can see these, these markings on the, on the globe from different direction means that if we measure in this direction, we know the time difference from this antenna to this antenna. So we know where they are pointing that, but we don't know anything about where they are in this, that direction. Then they turn that way and they know, and then we can triangulate in different directions and finally figure out where we are. So uh, what I did with this, I got this schedule of, uh, of the choreography and figured, okay, each star that we will look at can be represented by a point on the globe. If you take just a normal from the star pointing to the globe, Okay, that star is here, that star is here, and then we're looking at that star, which is here, and that became like um, a schedule of points on the globe that progress over the course of these measurements. And then in a very, very simplistic terms, I took, okay, say, south are on the globe is low pitch, north is high pitch, that's how we look at the map. East is to the right and west is to the left. And then created just an instrument that uh, would play these points. And that sounds like this.
So I don't know about you, but um, maybe due to the the tuning that you get from these things, it it sounds a little bit folk music ish. <laughs> so it would be I don't know folk music from Mars. Or <laughs> so at least that's one one of the techniques. Uh, let's go on to another. I mean, all of these uh, aspects collaborate. Um, make different models for me that I can use as compositional models and ways of viewing the data and then again ways of creating the composition. Another thing that I learned, I got this uh, this figure here with the waves on the, on the left that you can see and um, the astronomers in Bonn told me well this is, uh, this is a representation of how the antennas move along the globe during one uh, during 24 hours. So it's not more exciting than, I mean, it's actually acceleration of each point, but you could also translate it down to, okay, a position on the globe goes this way and then that way and this way. Not terribly exciting, but you notice these uh, holes. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I asked one of the astronomers in, in Bonn, what, what are these holes? Well, Avin, he said, this is a representation of the non-uniform distribution of wealth on planet Earth as seen from a billion light years away. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> because where there are more money, there are more antennas and more points on this graph. And in poor areas of the world, there are no less antennas. Of course, there are also big oceans that that uh, makes some of these holes, but uh, I found it pretty interesting to think uh, about. And then just uh, brutally uh, sonifying these uh, traces uh, sounds like this. So that's the sound of an even distribution of wealth from planet Earth. <laughs> uh, okay, one final um, pretty non-scientific uh, way of sonifying this process and the data, which is, I mean, it's based on science, but it was more like an impression that I had. So uh, clocks move at different speeds under different gravitational uh, conditions. So clocks on Earth move slower than clocks in orbit. This is due to Einstein and relativistic uh, conditions. Uh, so if we have uh, some person living on the highest mountain on Earth for a hundred years coming down, they have actually experienced, personally experienced, a little bit less time than the person living down here. So, um, uh, the way this relates to the whole issue of calibrating the satellite navigation system is that clocks that we have here and clocks that we have on the satellites, they don't move at the same speed. There's no way to make them move at the same speed because time is relative. The, the time is different up there. So all the both clocks are precise, but within their own frame. So we have to calibrate and we have to synchronize these clocks. Otherwise, the satellite would move over here and say, okay, I know that I'm here at this point in time. And then your car trying to GPS navigate mm. would have uh, an increasing deviation for each day when the clocks <laughs> moved apart. So this has to be synchronized, uh, and there is no, uh, when I say that it's a non-scientific way, 
it's not that I have taken any actual data from clock synchronization from the VLBI system, but just the idea. And I've used it in this way um, that, uh, to just create different metronomes. Maybe you haven't thought about this, but when you create a metronome digitally in your computer audio system or in your watch or any sort of digital clock, it is based on a small counter. So the basic clock of the audio, for example, at CD quality is 44,100 ticks per second. And this, we know, we can, we can relate to that. That's the smallest amount of time that we can have. Then, to make a metronome that tri triggers once every second, we use this audio clock at 44,000 ticks, and we add, we start at zero, and we will add a small amount for each clock tick. What we add is one divided by 44,000, we add this up and we get a linear increase. And when this value gets to one, we send out a tick and we restart the process. And then we have a clock, a metronome that is tied to the audio clock and it ticks once per second. Then if we want to modulate this clock and synchronize it with some other source, we can, like we do here, make some small jumps synchronization jumps that let this secondary clock jump towards the master clock. And we can jump closer to the next tick or we can jump backwards in time. And this is a process, this is an idea that I implemented in my software. And with a gradual, the bottom thing here is the gradual uh, scaling of how much does it synchronize. So that means that it could, I could set, uh, initiate different rhythms and rhythmical processes at different speeds and make them slowly come together. I found this immensely interesting musically. Um, I don't know if you agree, but you can hear uh, how it sounded. So approximately in the middle of that uh, segment that we heard, uh, a new master clock entered at a slower speed. So everyone else would sort of gravitate towards that. Questions about this? <sighs> Pretty complex. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So when it comes to the uh, sound design, Sounds or how it feels different from the previous uh, projects that we were showing. Mm, yeah. Yes, I think this uh, this simple sinoid uh, sounds for me represented a, a a connection to I don't know 
science fiction or what you hear in old movies when they have this control room in Houston and it's like doot, 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 radio beacons and these sort of things. Um, and I also looked at the the noisy basic source of the the quasar signal itself and also tried to to make use of that so so yeah uh, I think that the the simplest way of saying is that the more there's much more simple sign tones in this project than the previous ones yeah so do you think that it's kind of representing representing the space that happened like billion years ago because the wave that we receive now is something that happened like so much time ago yeah yeah i haven't thought about if the sound represent that time gap but it's it's true that uh, actually the signal that, that we receive now were sent before the Earth was formed. Yeah. So it's it's that old. Yeah. So it's uh, it's completely unfathomable <laughs> to, to try to represent it, but we can fantasize. Um, and there was in in the question of. Um, Responsivity or latency and real-time interactivity, this, the response time of this system would be pretty slow if we were trying to interact with the source. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, what I have shown you uh, for both installations as a set of modules or themes that represents the source data in different ways. And the organization over time of these modules is actually, in most cases, just uh, just a schedule to make some variation. And uh, I have tried to make it interesting for an, a listener to listen to it for two or three minutes. And then it should also be interesting to come back or to have it on for a longer period of time, which was part of the challenge, I think and which might relate to other sonification tasks as well. Maybe if you have a scientific sonification that you actually need to hear from nine to four every day, <laughs> you would have a, you would have a, a job to make it actually interesting and satisfying for those operators that use this as a monitoring signal also. Uh, actually, uh, I am all through. We can we can um, listen to the live stream from Kartwerke uh, and VLBI Music, uh, just so that you can um, know that I'm not lying. It's it's <laughs> continuously playing. And um, as preparation for this talk, you got a reference to a web page where I go even more in depth in explaining each of these different phenomena and a few more that I didn't um, talk about today um, about the technique and about how the earth is moving through space and how it's not really a rock ball but it's more like a lump of jelly and all of these funny things. Yeah, okay, this is how it sounds now.
that. So, uh, as you can understand, I didn't have any control of uh, which part of it that was playing. Maybe if we turn it on in five minutes, there will be a completely different sound. But one thing that I didn't explain is that uh, you can actually hear in this music, if you familiarize, familiarize yourself with how it usually sounds, you can hear if it sounds more or less orderly and disorderly, and that is actually in real time affected by solar flares. So if there's a lot of solar flares, uh, the music will be more disturbed because it disturbs also the measurements. And then you can use it as a northern light indicator. Mm. So you can run outside if you hear. Now, now there's northern lights, so you can run to the woods. Yes. Uh, so uh, I went through the, the link a little bit and uh, in the implementation details, like you have said, you uh, are using both C sound and Python. Uh, could you please explain a little bit on that? So mm -hmm. How do you like uh, integrate in the end and how it is like projected and presented, for instance? Yeah. So uh, C sound can run as a module in Python. So here, the, the main program is Python. And then just using CSAN as the audio engine. And a lot of the data processing is much easier to do in Python. So taking a list of 1,200 values and sorting them and refining them in different ways in CSAN is kind of impractical. Mm -hmm. You could do it, but it's, it's really not the way. <laughs> So the uh, leaning on, on Python to do that and leaning on C sound to do the, the audio processing helps uh, immensely for me to to make to realize this. Which libraries do you use mostly in Python? Sorry? Which libraries did you use mostly in For this it's nothing fancy. It's, I mean it's just getting the data in and using regular numpy uh, to to sort and and get access to these arrays of data. Okay. And uh, since uh, both of these installations have uh, very long running times, and I don't want to, as Eric also asked uh, about the, how much attention do you have to pay to, to them actually keep running. So I have watchdog processes in the programs. So CSound will send a signal uh, once every second, or I don't remember, some pretty short period, maybe every 10 seconds, to uh, a separate Python watchdog process. If this process hasn't heard from CSound in a while, it will terminate and restart the whole thing, and similarly with Python and all of these other processes. At some time, I also automated um, that this watchdog process would send me an email when something was happening, but uh, I don't actually remember. We stopped doing it <laughs> at some time. It, uh, in the beginning, there was a ton of emails coming from this process because every time the program would sort of slightly bump, it would send me an email saying, maybe there is something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm not able to load the stream in the app. Yes. Is that why? You, you know why? <laughs> yes, I know why. Um, actually, in the app, I hard-coded the address to the server running the software. And this was working fine for six years. Then they had a power outage at the mapping authority, and all the machines went down, and they gave me a new address when they rebooted. And I had specifically said I needed a static address. So. Of course, this could be, I mean, could be done in a smarter way, and I would do it in a more robust way later, but right now, the actually, the app points to the wrong IP address, which is embarrassing, <laughs> but true. But the address that you uh, see on the slide here yeah. is the, the right one. So if you point um, iTunes or Winamp, something to to that URL, you will get the right string. Yeah. Did you get any feedback from the astronomers uh, at Svalbard or the Max Planck Institute uh, on the music? Yes. They were 
100% positive about it. Uh, they were really happy because astronomers, as we all are, they const constantly fight for funding. And they want to convey what they do to a broader public and to politicians and to money money spenders around. Um, so I actually got an, um, a few emails from different astronomers, also from NASA, saying that this is totally fantastic. You have explained this in a much clearer way than we could. And perhaps part of the reasons, reason for that is that I didn't know anything about it before I started. So I know I experienced all the hardships in understanding how the system works as someone else from the outside would. And then, of course, it's represented in a pretty non-scientific way, so it's perhaps engaging in a different aspect. Yes. Okay. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm around, so you can reach me and ask more questions at any time if you want, but... Let's just double check. Is there any questions from also? No. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's that concludes the first uh, first uh, speech from uh, for this notification course. Thank you so much for coming, and uh, I think we should be very giving a hand.